Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're back. We're live. We're here on Research in Manoa. <clears throat> and today we have Barry Leonard, who is an associate specialist in geophysics uh, at HIGP. And if you didn't know by now, HIGP stands for the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. It's part of SOES, the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. And if you didn't know, SOES and HIGP are world famous. This is the place for this kind of research. We have this fabulous environment to work with here. We have fabulous people here. We attract them like magnetism. <laughs> and it just so happens that Barry Leonard is an expert in magnetism. And that means he's a very magnetic guy. I can feel it now. Hi, welcome to the show, Barry. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> so let's start out with what is magnetism anyway? Magnetism is a, a field, is probably the best way of describing it. It's a curious concept because it's something we really pulled out of our heads to explain what happens. When you get two magnets, as you know, they attract each other. If you rotate them around, they repel each other. There's a force there that, that causes them to attract. And we can't see. It'll work in a vacuum. It doesn't need anything. It's called action at a distance. So what causes this force is, is still, in some ways, we, they, then we have to get into what atoms and molecules oh, do. Let's do And there are certain types of atoms yeah. that have magnetism. Uh, it's a property of the electrons in their outer shells. Is that, is that depends on uh, where they are on the periodic table of elements? Uh, not exactly, no. There are quite a few magnetic materials, but the main one, as we know, is, is iron, but also nickel has... Uh, it's got to have generally more than one electron in its outer shell in certain types of orbits. Okay. Um, but anyway, iron is the main one. That's okay. the one that dominates the permanent magnetism. So how do the electrons create the field? When uh, there's a guy called Michael Faraday back in the 19th century that worked out that you could uh, basically that a magnetic field would cause a current when you varied it. And he made a law about that, Faraday's law, which is the basis of all generators, basically. And it's when you change a magnetic field inside an electrical loop of wire, you will induce a voltage or an electromotive force in that loop. And that will cause a current to flow if you connect it to something. I'm smiling because <laughs> you're making light of it. Our Western civilization is based on this notion. <laughs> Without well, Faraday and all that, we wouldn't be having the show or anything. <laughs> exactly. And so it's really become a huge part of what we do. And the other one is, of course, the electric field, which is all sort of combined. It's called one of the major four forces by the physicists. It's electromagnetic because these experiments that Faraday did, beautiful experiments. He was also a real showman, a kind of Donald Trump type character. There's room for that in science. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and he was one of the first. Yeah. And he built these beautiful instruments. He was an experimentalist where he brought all the politicians around to see him. And of course he was hugely recognized, but uh, eventually he didn't have a very good, or it wasn't a perfect description of the math behind the whole thing. So he found this young guy that was like, uh, could have been his son, called Maxwell. And this guy was just absolutely fascinated by this experimental results he got and made this beautiful set of equations, which are valid to this day, that describe all of electromagnetism. They're four vector differential equations. What, what do they achieve, these, these equations? They allow you to explain virtually anything that electricity and magnetism do. So these elements go in and this comes out. Well, there are equations that allow you to describe if you have a current flowing um, in, in a material, how, what the magnetic field will be due to that current. So they relate it, and these things are vectors, so the equations are not simple. But this is the basis on, every engineer would know about these vectors. Yes. And, um, and this is the basis for, what, electric motors and electronics in general, isn't it? Everything electrical. Wow, and magnetic. going some, yeah. Because uh, magnetism itself, it turns out we explain that by saying there are little loops of current, and, and those currents uh, cause the magnetism. So even magnetism is due to electric currents, and that causes these two types of fields, 
which are, we just use to explain how things connect on each other at a distance. And there are electric and magnetic fields, and these are all interrelated in these four sets of equations that yeah. Maxwell came up with in the late 19th century. Now, this is a little off the point, but I, my curiosity abides. Um, this talk of um, these um, quiet bombs that will, the impulse bombs, I guess, that will interfere with electrical fields. Um, that will, for example, if, 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 if um, a device like this is uh, deployed in a city, it will stop all the electric ma magnetic processing in the city, turn off everything. Uh, has this got to do with this whole thing about electromagnetic uh, fields? It's a very dramatic form of it. It's basically, you're talking about a nuclear explosion. It's an electromagnetic pulse, and that's the only pulse, thing yeah. really. Well, there are some things the Earth's sun will actually do this as well at a time when you have these huge flares on the sun, and the sun is constantly spitting out protons that are, that are coming out in all directions, but a lot of them hit the Earth, but they get deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. But when we have these huge solar flares, magnetic storms on the sun, they cause these huge pulses of magnetic field coming onto our planet. And these can cause very large currents because they change their pulses. And they'll cause huge currents and sometimes blow out big electrical... Destro insulation. Destroy the electrons. Not destroy them, but just blow their fuses, basically. Okay. It's a bit more like it. Okay. But when you talk about a nuclear weapon, which is much closer, it will be, say, in a city, then that pulse can spread quite a long way because of the huge currents that come out when a nuclear explosion comes off, as all kinds of stuff comes out. And that would destroy the electrons. And that could, I wouldn't say destroy, but it could interfere, it could temporarily disrupt it. Very close, of course, it destroys everything. It will vaporize everything within... Uh, a few cubic miles, uh, a typical hydrogen bomb, or, or mm. even bigger. But Is there any other way to create that pulse? Uh, I don't, not that, I, it has to be due to an electric current, because that's the only way you can get a magnetic field. So there has to be some huge current, and uh, in, in terms of the uh, size of the currents, there's an interesting one called the equatorial electric rejet and uh, that flows around the whole magnetic equator and it's induced by the sun, by the, uh, the solar variations. So, and this is like uh, hundreds of thousands of amps up in, but really high in the atmosphere. And this causes a local effect close to the equator. But that is gigantic compared to say the typical currents that we get in power lines and they're AC, even real big ones that supply 100 megawatts. I worked with one that actually went from uh, Oregon down to LA. It's one of the biggest DC, direct current power lines, and that was 100 megawatts, which translates into about 1,000 amps at, uh, uh, it's a, a megawatt, a watt is a, a volt times an amp, basically. So to get 100 million watts, you basically need, uh, I, you need 100,000 volts, basically, on each end of the thing, and that gives you 1,000 amps. That's just Ohm's law. And so these vectors um, can affect electricity, just as they affect the magnetic field. Well, they're, inter they're, they're an absolutely essential part of these things. The fields are sort of what um, the way in which the forces have an effect on something else. They transmit their effect through a field. And uh, that's just the way we describe it as a field. And we can measure it, but we can't see it. We, we can put a bunch of iron filings on a piece of paper. People have done that in school. And look at the patterns that you get when you shake the paper. And they'll line up with the magnetic fields. Makes it so interesting. Now, what role does gravity have to play in all this, if any? Gravity is a completely separate force. It's one of the four fundamental forces, and it's a relatively weak force, but it acts over very long distances. So that's a different thing to electromagnetic forces. So it doesn't affect the electromagnetic field. 
No, not a, at least uh, in a relativistic sense you might be able to say it does, but not in normal day-to-day -day behavior. Gravity has nothing to do okay, good. with electromagnetism. Why did, you, why did you get into this in the first place? It, it almost, I'm going to make a wild guess, so you were fascinated with this notion of a field that you couldn't see, which yet had some kind of effect on things. Is that why? Yeah. What made you interested? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it was that. It was playing with magnets as a kid. Um, but I think part of it also was uh, a fascination with mathematics. I got a, a degree at a very good high school in New Zealand and had some very good teachers. And, uh, but uh, my interest in this started actually at, with mechanical things. I had a thing called a Meccano set, which is like the English version of an erector set. I remember these, that. These beautiful metal parts. I remember that, yeah. <laughs> They'd be yeah. considered they don't make dangerous. them anymore, but I remember that. <laughs> and they were I, wonderful. I only got up to a set seven, but that um, I just was fascinated with that. <laughs> Building things, yeah. So then I went on to high school, and I, I got interested in mechanics problems, which usually involve gravity, physical motion, and got really fascinated with the ability of mathematical equations to describe physical things that happen, acceleration and movements of things in orbits. I was fascinated by the Apollo project. That, yeah, to me, was yeah. one of oh, yeah. the best things we've ever done, basically. Yeah, was in 1979. Yeah. So that was so one of the reasons my dream was 69. to work at NASA, and I did actually get a job so, there. But where about, uh, so from high school, what? From high school, I guess I went to university. I, I wanted to be an engineer, so I got a bit of background in mechanical work and stuff like that. But then I changed my mind through high school, I think, uh, and decided to, uh, to go into uh, a regular BS at the university and majoring in physics and math. Um, Where was that? That was at Victoria University in Wellington. Okay. So. There's not a lot of universities, only that. That'd be the best school in New Zealand? Uh, they, I wouldn't say that. I'd say all the universities are pretty much, they're all government run, so they're not, there are no private universities in New Zealand. It's a good system. So they have, uh, and they're very well, or at least when I was there, very well funded. It was free if you could qualify. Lovely. In fact, you even get paid for it. So I wish we could get back to that. Yeah. It was like the GI Bill, but it was true for everyone. If you could do an extra year at high school, you got a scholarship for your whole time, even through to a PhD oh, at university. So did they I, take uh, older gentlemen? Hmm? Did they take older gentlemen? Um, anyone in principle could uh, do the equivalent of uh, a high school degree. When I was there, they could g do one year and they'd pay for it themselves. And they had to talk the instructors into letting them in. That they knew enough math, for example, in <laughs> physics to even be able to follow anything. So there was a pretty rigorous uh, thing. They didn't actually have to do a formal exam like you did in high school. But they, uh, the system was that if these people could pass one year, then they were the same. All their uh, full-time courses, they were the same as all the high school students. They effectively got their fees covered. So they did allow for older people um, to, okay. to basically do it. You said you were uh, interested in math before, and it reminds me, uh, I went to the, uh, uh, on Woodlawn Drive, the uh, Institute for Astronomy, IFA. Mm -hmm. They had an open house, and there were a bunch of mathematicians there. So I said to one of them, uh, what makes you so passionate about math? He said, passionate? Isn't everyone passionate about math? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no, but I just wonder what makes you so passionate, what made you and makes you so passionate about math. Why think, is it so important to you? I think it's got something to do, in a way, with music. Both my parents were musical, mm -hmm. and I was sort of fascinated by the, uh, um, the structure of notes on a musical scale, which is a, have a mathematical structure, as you probably know when you, you have an octave, a musical octave is doubling the frequency. So it's sort of almost like a digital thing. You go two times two times two, and you go an octave every time you do that. But uh, that structure, but the real thing, I think, was just puzzles. To me, we didn't have video games and these mechanics problems where you got to use all this algebra and geometry that you'd already learned. If, if the boat solved. is going up the stream at three knots, 
and the current exactly. is coming down the stream at four knots. <laughs> well, we had things more like pendulums actually sliding down a plane. And okay. You had to calculate where, where they were when the thing got to the bottom. And problems like that were a mixture and quite complex. And, uh, and I was just fascinated by them. They were, they were difficult. And uh, so I think that's how I sort of cut my teeth on mathematics in high school. And I've never forgotten any of those yeah, things. So then you, 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 physics was the, the best extension of that, I guess. And um, after, after you graduated from Wellington, what then? You take a PhD there or later? No, I did a PhD in Texas at a place called, it used to be called the Southwest Center for Advanced Studies. It was meant to be as kind of a Texas Caltech, but then it was just down the road from Texas Instruments at the time, so there were some big funders of it, but... Uh, Caltex, Caltex. <laughs> it was in Richardson, <laughs> Texas. And, okay. uh, so um, what happened was they turned it right before I came there into the University of Texas at Dallas, which was a relatively small... Uh, university, but full university. They had PhDs, and I went to work with a the guy there in magnetism. And, and what that, that was the great moment. That was the defining moment, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm not sure if I'd say that. I'd still say probably the defining moments were number one when I got my Meccano set, and number two when I did these mechanics problems in <laughs> high school. Going way back. <laughs> and uh, that was what uh, I think I really got uh, obsessed with those. Uh, things and just went all out. I'd come home and just work constantly on them, weekends too, and just doing as many as I could. I wanted to do the whole book, basically. We're going to have a defining <laughs> moment now on the show. We're going to take a break. Okay. <laughs> it's Barry Leonard. Uh, he's Hi. with HIGP, the I'm Hawaii Institute of Geophysical I host Likeable Science Associate Tech uh, Hawaii. And I do this because I care about science literacy in Hawaii. I want to spread the understanding Science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. I want to make sure the broadest possible spectrum of people understand the beauty and the value of science and realize that science plays out each and every day of their lives. I want you to understand that science is fun. So we bring on to this show each week guests or scientists, from astronomers to zoologists, and we talk about what they do and how they do it. But most importantly, we talk about why you should care about their work why you should see that their work has value and impact on your life. So I hope you'll join us Fridays, 1 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. You can watch us via live stream. You can watch us uh, recorded on Olelo. And you can see us uh, each week. We hope you'll join us. OK, we're back. We're live. We're having a wonderful time with Barry Leonard of HIGP, we're talking about, uh, ultimately talking about magnetism here. As I said before, he's a very magnetic guy. Yeah. You'll see what I mean. <laughs> here in Research in Manoa, one of my favorite shows. So, um, organized by Red Butler of HIGP. Thank you, Red. <laughs> Thanks, Red. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, last we left the story, mm -hmm. this great story, uh, you were in Texas, and there was uh, not a defining moment, but a moment of interest with magnetism. Tell us what happened after that. Um, after I completed my PhD, I, I got um, offered a, a position in, uh, at, it was actually a postdoc at the University of Maryland, but it was working at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And, uh, Which is and, in Maryland. Yes. And, uh, and it was a division called the Astrochemistry Division. And it was a guy who just got a brand new magnetic lab with all the bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, a guy that was uh, offered a job as a professional football player. <laughs> and a guy called Peter Wazalewski, he went to Antarctica <laughs> and changed his mind. He wanted to do research. They got a mountain named after him down there. <laughs> Forget the football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Big guy, you know. So. <laughs> So anyway, he had a lab, and it was a relatively small lab, but he was with some wonderful people there that were all into the origins of the solar system and things like that. But they were particularly interested in meteorites and, and magnetic properties. But ultimately, they were quite interested in Mars. At the time, we were just, uh, it was about the uh, time of the Viking, first Viking landers on Mars. So why do you need to know about chemistry in space? You know, astrochemistry, did you say? Yeah, I think that's because it encompasses the uh, 
the reason for chemistry is that all the information we have about space, or an enormous amount of it that we get from remote sensing, is spectral. But we look at the energy lines that are discrete when you split them up with like a prism, a spectrometer, you find that there are a lot of lines that are characteristic of elements. And, on the uh, periodic table. Yes. On the very same periodic table here on Earth, that exactly. periodic table, yeah. And so we recognized those same lines, and that also told us something about what the planets were made of. And so that was some of the first, and that was done long before we did space flight. But it mostly happened, I think, starting in the 20th century, a bit before. But uh, it had been done a long time before NASA sort of started seriously actually going out there. I don't know the uh, official definition of the word chemistry, but it connotes to me somebody with beakers and test tubes and little bubbles and processes, you know? processes changing things in chemistry. Um, so uh, is, when you say astrochemistry, are you talking about just the elements or are you talking about changing the elements through some sort of chemical processes? Well, chemistry has also got an aspect of saying how do these elements combine yeah. and what compounds can they make? Yeah. So uh, the information you get from chemistry tells you, even though you can recognize elements, what possible compounds. Like if you see hydrogen and oxygen, that would be, um, that's all. You'd, you'd say, well, that's water. But you usually don't get that. You get all these spectra together, and you've got to go down and identify. And you might have a bit of, and you don't really know very accurately the strength or the concentration of these things. But if I learn my chemistry here on Earth using just the elements in the periodic table. Don't I know all that I need to know about chemistry involving compounds derived using the periodic table? Why do I have to have a special kind of chemistry in space? It's not a special time. It, you're exactly right. It is the same processes. The elements aren't any different, even in the stars, from what we can tell. They may be at higher temperatures. In fact, they are. We see the suns. But we know they're the same elements because the spectra define them so well. And we know that's true on Earth, and it has been confirmed on other planets when we've gone there, like the moon. And we, we looked at the spectral properties of the moon. We're still doing that. And then got the samples and took them back and did the more conventional thing of analyzing them in a chemical laboratory and finding out what was there. And yet that we were right, using our spectral devices the, exactly. the light yes. is its correct way to measure what's out. Absolutely. Anyway, so, okay, so we have magnetism. I, I tend to go off the track a little <laughs> bit, Barry, forgive me that, <laughs> just curiosity. So magnetism, uh, magnetism at the Space Center in Maryland. Uh, and uh, let's see, what, what happened after that? Uh, you went to the, am I right, the Caltech Center? I went to the seismological laboratory. Uh, in fact, that's where I met Red. As a, he was doing a PhD there. Yeah. And uh, they offered me a job getting back into this thing of magnetic sounding. They wanted to look at estimates of the properties around faults uh, with the hope of predicting earthquakes. Faults here? In, uh, in, in, no, in California. But, but in, the, in, the, in the United in, in States. The Earth, yeah, yeah, on yeah. Earth, Earth boats. Earth yeah. boats okay. <laughs> so it involved just putting out a, a, a very sophisticated magnetometer, very sensitive, cryogenic, in fact, it worked at liquid helium temperature, and some long electrodes connecting porous pots that measure the electric field. And you measure these all simultaneously. And because the the variations in magnetic field coming in from the sun that I mentioned before due to pulses, magnetic storms, but even small fluctuations on the sun. It's a very active place. So yes. you get these pulses of magnetic energy yes. coming in and, and hitting the Earth's surface. And it turns out those waves, electromagnetic waves, penetrate down into the Earth. Through the soil, the rock, all right, that? Through everything. So if there's not a lot of resistance, they'll go a long way. It turns out the more conductors there are, the less far they'll go. It's a thing called the skin dip. And they die to one over the... So there's uh, iron down there. Um, is it a deposit of iron? That's going, to, that's going to be an obstacle for these waves. 
Yes, any conductor. It doesn't have to be iron. It can even be things like salt water, which is an even, uh, because iron doesn't occur naturally in a lot of places. It's uh, generally an ore. So it's combined with other, uh, like oxygen. Okay, so the waves go down, and the waves are affected by the pulses, and somehow you're measuring the magnetic field mm -hmm. in, in the crack. No, at the surface. At the surface to see, to predict an earthquake. Um, what we were trying to get was an estimate of the resistivity. It is sort of like seismic sounding. You probably know we use explosions and we time them to figure out what the, the speed of sound is in rocks, the seismic velocity. And uh, that uh, can be very sophisticated. We, we now face oil exploration, so there's lots of money in it. That's the main way of finding oil, is to put out a whole huge array of these microphones, basically, all around a big truck that generates all these waveforms and then interpret this in terms of what is down under the ground, particularly whether there's some hard rock forming a kind of a cat that oil will connect underneath. So you can see. It gives you eyes. It gives you eyes you on the ground. see the formations exactly. of the rock. Then you interpret the formations. Certain kinds of, it's like reading an x-ray. Certain kinds of formations suggest certain deposits. Exactly. Yeah. So resistivity is similar, but it doesn't measure seismic velocity. It measures electrical conductivity. So we can get a quantitative estimate of, of, the, of electrical conductivity underground by looking at different frequencies. So why does electrical conductivity, wait, I don't want to stop you from saying that, by measuring, by measuring it. The electric and magnetic fields at the surface. Okay, so you, okay. As a function of time. So then that gives you a handle on conductivity, and conductivity lets you predict earthquakes. We expect to see, or there were some predictions that said that electrical conductivity would change a small amount, maybe a few percent, when the rocks were getting stressed, when they were getting squished up. And uh, there, there's theory, it's sort of like, um, it's the reverse of piezoelectric, where you uh, basically, you, you can, you get an electrical voltage, it's sort of similar in a way, due to squeezing a certain material, it will produce a voltage. Um, but the, uh, the idea here was that the resistivity, you could say in a simple way that if you had like a spongy rock, like Hawaii rocks, they've got lots of holes in them, and if the, um, they're full of water or salt water, they'll be quite conductive. But as you squish them, all the holes get squished together, and it's like wringing out a sponge. That happens as you get deeper. Then there'll be less, there'll be basically a much higher resistance because all the salt water's gone away. So you, that results in quite a dramatic change in most of the Hawaiian Islands around sea level. We have uh, rocks, essentially the islands here are all a bit like sponges. They're very porous. So, so those, those changes will somehow telegraph the possibility of an earthquake? Yeah, we expect that change to be very gradual. It's not a sudden signal. We measure these things over typically days or weeks to do the experiment because we need very long periods, like periods of an hour to get down, say, 100 miles, and at least 10 or 20 seconds to get down even two or three miles. So it, the depth depends on how long. So we have a very long time series. We run this thing and digitize it continuously, three components of magnetic field and two components of electric field just the horizontal. And the electric fields basically are the things produced from these currents that are induced in the ground, whereas the magnetic fields are mainly what's coming in from outside, from the sun. And if we use Maxwell's equations to solve that problem, we can actually determine the resistivity um, that is underground, even uh, its three-dimensional, two-dimensional structure. And those changes will tip you off. And the changes, the, that's right, I got a bit carried away. I and was the pressure, the pressure under there. And the, the pressure, pressure will, will reduce generally the, uh, um, the conductivity or increase the resistivity. There it is. That was the argument. There that if you, could, if you could see those by just measuring month after month, we measured the same sites. 
We had three sites every month. So we'd go out every month and measure them for two years and look at the determined uh, apparent resistivities, they're called, as a function of frequency, and then looked at whether there was any detectable change when we saw an earthquake. You can't make this up. <laughs> Why would you want to? <laughs> <laughs> this is not science fiction. This is actual science. Yeah, this is the... <laughs> My head is coming apart. OK, we're going to come right back. When we come back, Barry, is, Barry Leonard is going to tell us what Metzl is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the the basis of what's right and what's good and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're having a wonderful day with Barry Leonard of HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysical Planetology at SOEST. He is an associate specialist in geophysics, and we are talking about magnetism. And it's a totally magnetic discussion, and you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I don't know who thought of it. <laughs> like, who in the world would have woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and thought about conductivity and, and how it's related to stresses under the surface and you can predict earthquakes that way? Amazing. And I asked you before, you know, before the break, I said, we're going to come back and, and, and we're going to um, talk about Metzl. And uh, you pointed out that I would, must be saying Metzl with a Wellington accent because it's not Metzl at all. It's Maxwell. It's James Clerk Maxwell. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Like the coffee, so. <laughs> and he's part of this. So the, oh, he's the an formula part that of he it. made way back with the equations is yeah. still valid. Yep. Still using He them. made four equations that explain electromagnetism completely. And we've never found an exception <laughs> to his equations. So it's not it's not a matter of rewriting Maxwell's equations, it's a matter of implementing them exactly. in different applications. Now you're using magnetism in various you're doing research in various uh, situations involving magnetism. Can, can you tell us about some of the others? Um, the, the other things that I've done with magnetism, uh, essentially my, I've been dedicated to looking at not magnetism but magnetic fields. There is a bit of a difference. Magnetism implies permanent magnetism which is basically a rock that's magnetized like magnetite, okay. that has a permanent magnet. Okay. That is different. What it causes is a magnetic field, but we get those coming in without any magnets. We get them through any electric current that flows, produces a magnetic field. So what I've been, um, in, in terms of applications of magnetism, the, uh, the other one is the uh, use of, magnetism in rocks to determine how the way the Earth's magnetic field, which is, of course, a huge part of magnetism. We've known about that for three or 400 years. The Earth the is Earth. a big magnet. Yeah. <laughs> the Earth is a big magnet, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's enabled navigation, which is a huge part oh, sure, of our history. Sure, the compass, yeah. Exactly. So people knew pretty well how the Earth's magnetic field behaved, and they worked out it was just like a big bar magnet at the center of the Earth. And uh, that was basically uh, a huge driver of the interest in magnetism. How, how does that work? I mean, how, why is the Earth a big bar magnet at the center? That's an excellent question. It's, uh, we still um, haven't really narrowed down all the details, but we think it's because the outer part of the Earth's core is molten. It's a liquid. It's a pretty viscous liquid, but it's also a very good conductor. We think it's mostly mm -hmm. made of Maybe iron. Maybe iron in there. And on top of all this, it's rotating. So there's a rather, the other thing it does that's very curious, we found out very recently, is that it reverses. Uh, sort of a bit randomly, but more or less every half million years. Is it a slosh effect or what? 
Uh, no, it's a bit more, it, it, it was very difficult for us initially to even believe it was happening. Um, but when we ex eventually accepted by measuring the magnetism of rocks, which act like tape recorders throughout the whole Earth's history, the Earth's yeah. field gets frozen into the rock. Yeah. And if you orient the rock and, and then measure it with a sensitive instrument, what its direction is, you can figure out what the field was at that rock so site. It's like basically. the rings on a tree. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a recorder that, that uh, this is called paleomagnetism, where you look at the uh, magnetism of rocks in order to infer what the Earth's magnetic field was in the past. How can you tell when a given, you know, piece of data from a paleo rock, I don't know if that's the right term, but from the paleo data you're getting, how can you date that? Well, you date it with uh, uh, whatever technique is appropriate to the age, but they're basically radioactive techniques that depend on the rate at which isotopes decay and how much of the original thing that uh, was decaying. Uh, potassium argon is a good example. That goes back to several million years. Uh, but radiocarbon is the one where more familiar with C12 that we used to date more historic stuff. Why would I, why would I want to know about the history of, of magnetism in a given rock? Because I think you, you said it very well that if you're looking at magneti magnetic things in rocks and rocks are layered and they seem to change, you obviously would like to know what the time scale of those changes are. Because then you look forward. Yeah. And because uh, then you know their frequency, which is very important in terms of what could even cause them. And this was the way we figured out that the Earth is reversed, field is reversed uh, quite a few times in the last three million years. What would have caused it to reverse? This is, uh, we think it's due to currents flowing in the Earth's molten core and the interaction of those currents with the rotation of the Earth. Really that's a really tough problem, it turns really out, because it's both hydrodynamics, the motion of fluids, which is physical motion of stuff, and uh, Maxwell's equation. So you've got these two things all combined, and you've got to solve that problem as to what they will do. Could you learn from the Earth in terms of making a magnet? You, you mentioned that, uh, that the core of the Earth makes, makes it uh, a magnet from from, what, from the South Pole to the North Pole and all that's a magnet. Uh, and one of the reasons it's a magnet, maybe the a big reason, is that it's, it's got molten conductors in there and it's spinning also. Suppose I made a little earth about that big and somehow I generated a lot of heat in the core of it and I put a conductive material, I make it six inches, and I got it to spin. Would I be creating a, a, a powerful magnet that way? I don't think so. I don't see that as producing a very large magnetic field. Um, the, what we have proposed for the core is it's called a self-sustaining dynamo. But the actual math of how that thing happens is not clear even to me. It's, it's basically quite a complex problem. But it is at least theoretically feasible that this combination, but it's certainly not a very good way of making a regular magnet when we can get a regular magnet just anyway. by winding a wire around a piece of... <laughs> We're ahead. <laughs> or just basically holding a very strong magnet, which we have to do next to a magnetizable material. That's how all magnets are made, basically. You just put them in a big magnetic field. And even natural magnets, it turns out this guy, Wazalewski, I worked out, discovered that the way magnetite gets magnetized is lightning that big strokes of lightning, he studied these rocks up in Colorado, were coming into the ground and using huge currents that actually magnetized this lodestone. And that's why it was lodestone, that it had this enormous uh, magnetic field. It stays. Yeah. Yeah. Because... So, well, I want to shift in the last few minutes here to other sensor, uh, sensory type uh, research you're doing that uh, is not necessarily... Uh, magnetic fields, right? You were mentioning that you do other sensors just to get the full picture of your work. Yes, I became uh, quite interested in things called aerosols, which are uh, very small particles of liquid and, and solids 
that float around in the atmosphere. Uh, it may not seem obvious, but when things get much, very, very small, little particles and drops, they don't just fall under gravity. They have a very long settling time. Clouds are a very good example. And clouds are just droplets of water that are about five microns. Uh, I've got to use microns here. It's, uh, it's, it's probably worth saying that, tiny, uh, that tiny, tiny. yeah, a millimeter, it's a millionth of a millimeter, so a thousandth of a millimeter. So anyway, clouds are the most obvious example. They're things that float, droplets of water, very small ones, and just float around and form all these amazing patterns and, and things when water condenses. But so when, when, water, when water condenses, it falls to the earth. Why don't the droplets fall to the earth? Because that's, that's a very good question. But I think it's uh, basically because the... Uh, um, the droplets are, are, are actually moving a lot. They're moving inside the clouds. And there is basically a, um, an updraft that has thermal origins in the clouds. There's a yeah. quite, quite a strong wind going from the bottom of the cloud to the top that we generally find. There are downdrafts too. But the, the, uh, these updrafts, which like I said, I just I won't get into the details, but say they're of thermal origin and plus the fact that water is constantly condensing and, and evaporating. And of course, when it evaporates, as we know, we've got to put a lot of heat into it, but when it condenses, it releases that heat, and that gives a lot of energy. So it self-perpetuates. Yes, so, yeah. it basically keeps these things floating because they're moving due to the heat energy. And of course, we've got vapor coming up constantly from the oceans that's feeding the water into the clouds. But I need air to do this. I could yes. not do this in a vacuum. No. The, the, the droplets would fall right down. No, you couldn't have water in a vacuum, and that's one of the no. main... You could have solids, of course, but they wouldn't... Uh, they would keep going at their initial velocity. If we blasted them out into space, things just keep going at whatever speed you give them when there's no resistance. Yeah. That's one of Newton's uh, <laughs> Galileo's law. See, all these old guys, they really knew what was going on. <laughs> Nothing's changed. So um, in the droplets now, in the, the uh, what did you call it, uh, vapor? Uh, uh, what, are you, what are you doing? With aerosol. Them? Aerosol. What are you doing with them? Uh, we're looking, um, we're, for one, it's very relevant to climate because the clouds do absorb uh, energy and they reflect it and uh, both from the bottom and the top. So they sort of shield the Earth, in a sense, from the sunlight coming in. So they're a major player in the, uh, in the climate modeling. And of climate change. Climate change, exactly. Ooh, so this is very relevant research right. then. So there's been a lot of interest in this, of explaining the part that clouds pay. We all know that carbon dioxide has been increasing by 25% since 1960 for the whole Earth. But, and that's one effect. We've also got methane and things that shield the greenhouse effect. Uh, but on top of that, and mixed in with the whole thing, are clouds, which uh, are basically affected a lot by pollution that we put up into the atmosphere. It's a natural that. process. Of, of as the, well the as natural processes. By the pollution. That's chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this is very relevant to climate change because of its thermal shielding. How can you measure now? We're talking sensors. How can you measure this? You use a laser. You reflect, a, you send a laser up into the atmosphere and you have a big telescope that's parallel to the laser. And so when the laser goes out, it gets scattered. And you're looking at the part that comes directly back, basically like a mirror. But of course, they don't act like mirrors. The light goes in all directions when it hits anything other than a mirror. But you get the bit that comes back into your light bucket. And you, you measure that as a function of time over a very short time, because you're going at the speed of light with the laser. So your laser goes up basically in a line. Very little comes out there because it's narrow. But when it hits these things at different distances, they radiate light back. And so you get a, a function of scattering as a function of time. And you can measure that amount of scattering over intervals. Now, the fastest one, the new digitizer, will do one meter intervals out to like 10 kilometers. So you get an enormous amount of information. On top of that, you can scan the laser quite rapidly and collect all that information to make a three-dimensional picture of what exactly the aerosols are doing. 
it bears a resemblance uh, to the, uh, the what the work you're doing uh, with the waves and the surface, looking down into the Earth, and waiting waiting for the return, like in the oil exploration model. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little different in that the scattering process. It, it is you're right. That's it more is powerful. a wave. The scattering process. Yeah. Is more powerful. So that does involve Maxwell's equations too, in terms of finding out <laughs> how much light you get back from a given sized particle. Um, I, I think one thing's clear is our audience, if they had any great interest, any, any interest at all about they have to look up Maxwell. Again, what was his full name again? James Clerk Maxwell. James Clerk Maxwell. So go take a look at that. I'm sure it's there on the web. Uh, and think of us. Think of Barry Leonard and me. Barry Leonard of HIGP, Associate at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysical Planetology, Associate Specialist in Geophysics. I have learned so much. You are a great teacher, Barry. I hope you teach a lot. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's research in Manoa. We're talking about magnetism and sensors all over Barry's world. <laughs> Thank you so much. Aloha. <laughs>